good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the New Frontiers in Buddhist Studies lecture series. I am Gong Mingyuan, uh, and I am very honored and glad to serve as an MC for today's lecture given by my colleague, Venerable Dr. Amritananda. Uh, as you might have read in the biographic information about him, uh, Venerable Dr. Amritananda is a PhD student, a PhD graduate, sorry, from Center of Buddhist Studies, HKU, and is now serving as an honorary lecturer at CBS. Uh, in fact, we have been classmates and friends for many years. Uh, among all the disciples of Venerable Professor Dhamma Jodi, uh, Venerable Dr. Amritananda is one of the few who can read several Buddhist canonical languages, uh, including Pali, Sanskrit, and Tibetan. So, well, I hope that in the near future, he could also pick up classical Chinese. Uh, besides that, uh, Venerable Dr. Amritananda is a very friendly teacher and is always patient to students. His topic today is uh, origins of the theory of four stages to arhatship in the Theravada soteriology. So the four stages, or sometimes referred to as four fusions, as you know, refers to the stream entrant, once returner, non-returner, and finally arhat, or in Pali, arahant. Uh, although these four spiritual attainments are now only discussed in Theravada Buddhism, uh, they are not strange to most of the Chinese Mahayana, uh, Mahayana Buddhists. Uh, in the very famous Diamond Sutra, Vajrachetika Prajna Paramita Sutra, uh, we know that there's a question as to whether a stream entrant have such a thought that I am a stream entrant. And the answer is no, uh, because a stream entrant does not have such an ideation that I am a stream entrant, therefore we call him a stream entrant. So likewise, an arhat does not have such an ideation that I am an arhat either. So today, Venerable Dr. Amrinanda is going to elaborate on the origins of the theory of the four stages. Now let us welcome Venerable Dr. Amrinanda, please. So good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. So good evening to you all. Um, thank you, Dr. Mingwen, for your nice introduction. And before this is starting, I would also like to thank Professor Guan Singh, Director of the Center of Buddhist Study, for organizing this event, an opportunity to share our thoughts with you. And thank you all of you for being here so that we can share. Uh, our thoughts. So as um, Dr. Mingyuan introduced, today our topic is the origin of the theory of four stages to arahanship in Theravada Sotriology. I use the Theravada term Theravada in the sense that today it is only the Theravada tradition seriously it as a sotriological idea. But in fact, if you go back to any of the Indian Buddhist school, that this theory was commonly held doctrine. All this, if you go back to the Sarvastivada, if you go back to Sautrantika, and most of the Indian is Indian Buddhist school. So these four stages were considered as an stages to the liberation or to the arahanship. So in that sense, uh, it is a four stage. Today, what I am going to do is try to show or we took the time to show you how these stages develop. Um, that is li a little bit challenging the traditional view in a sense that the tradition hold these four stages as taught by the Buddha. But in the course of today's talk, we will try to discover what is the truth in the traditional claim and how this develop. So some of you may be very new to this topic so let me uh, start with a short introduction to it. So you have a little bit of background of what I'm going to talk. Uh, theory of four stages to arahanship, you know, is an exhaustive list of stages. That exhaustive is a very inclusive. 
it includes many things, okay? Many practices, many lives, many circumstances, uh, different level of commitment. So it includes many things. In that sense, I say it's an exhaustive list, okay? It's a stage. Um, so according to the Theravada Buddhist tradition or the early, Buddhi, early Indian Buddhist tradition in general, it is believed that for one to liberate, one has to go through these four stages, you know, how his or her progress towards the liberation. And it not necessarily include one lifetime, it can include many lifetimes depending on the individual condition and commitment to spiritual practice. So in that sense, the four stages occur on the, in the, throughout the Pali canonical text, as well as the Chinese agamas in many different ways. They are occurring in our four stages together, they are occurring independently and they are occurring with all different kinds of practices. And in one of the discourses, not actually, this is either side the two, that this in the Sula Sihana, the Sutta of the Majjhima Nikaya, or the Madhyama Agama in the Chinese tradition. Actually, this in many more suttas mention it. I just said one that it says, um, this for a Buddhist practitioner can truly claim, you know, the, pride that the four stages are in a, only in Buddhism. In other words, it says in the way there is no this, no four stages, there is no Buddhism. There is no Buddhist practice. There is no spiritual path. Uh, it has been actually repeated even in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta in many discourses. And today, in, in the present Theravada tradition, these four stages, you know, function as the reference point, so reference point that orient and provide a criteria for a spiritual progress. That means the spiritual progress is measured, is mapped out in terms of these four stages. So four stages is a kind of an actually, I say, sotrological ideal, to it is an in the sense is an ideal and a practice. So this is a traditional uh, interpretation of the four stages, those who are new to it. So these are the four stages that usually in the traditional view, the standard view is uh, presented in us with the fetus. So the first stage is known as the stream entera. And he said to have abandoned three fetus, that is the cell view, irrational doubt towards the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha, and attachment to rituals and vow. And for him, there is a maximum seven life. Before he attain, he or she attain liberation, there can be maximum seven life among human and gods. It means once the person become a stream enterer, since then, person may maximum seven lives, go through maximum seven lives among gods and human, and is free from rebirth in unfortunate existence, such as animal, in a hungry ghost, in how, in all kind of, even it says, if he's born, he, he or she is born in a human state, will always born in a good family and in the wealthy family, since the attainment of this stage. On um, once returning, he, of course, does not abandon any fetus. He only abandons these this three. And plus what he does, he attenuates, he weakens the greed, hatred, and delusion. So he just attenuates this. And he doesn't uh, abandon any additional fetus. And 
this person will reborn just once more. Okay, just one more time among human or gods, either in the human world or in the heaven. Um, third stage is known as a non-returning. And this person abandoned two more fetters, that is sensual desire and illusion. Um, as a consequence, so they means together, this person has abandoned three plus two, five fetters. As a result of it, he will not reborn. He will not return to the human world or the, in the sensual world. Human, not just the human, but also in the some of the heavenly realm that are in the uh, sensual realm. Okay. And um, he will be born in pure abode, that is called Suddhavasa, something like a pure land that is said to be in the Rupa Loka, that is in the realm of form. The last stage is an Araham, and he abandoned five more for him to be an, somebody from the non regional to become an Araham, he need to abandon the five more fetters. That is the desire for rebirth in a realm of form, desire for rebirth in a formless realm, conceit, restlessness, and ignorance. And um, he has no birth, is completely liberated. Rahan has understood, he is uh, completely liberated, so he has no more rebirth. So first five are called the fetters related to the essential realm, so called lower realm, lower sphere, Orambagya Samyazanani. The last five are called the fetters related to higher, higher fetter or related to the higher realms. So this is the introduction. So these are the four stages. What I want to show you this, these are the four stages that I'm going to talk today. And why this study? Why, why this study is relevant or why need to do in this study? If they are only Buddhist teaching, commonly accepted by most of the Buddhist school, so automatically the question come, why do we need to study this? So I say this study is relevant for three reasons. First, when you look at the you know description of the liberating experience of the Buddha. That means when you look at the liberation process, the path went through by the historical Buddha. There is no mention of the four stages. There is not a single record. The Buddha's experience of liberation has been documented in the early Buddhist discourses many times, particularly uh, via Vedava Sutta, Bodhiraja Kumara Sutta, um, Arya Pariyasana Sutta, many more discourses, you know, in the form of the autobiography. The Buddha relates his experience, how he went through the process of liberation. And in the none of this uh, liberation process, there is mention of the four stages, it's completely absent. So it may raise a question whether the Buddha follow one path of liberation is prescribing another path for us. To some extent, this is justifiable because we can say, okay, Buddha is a teacher, so he follow one path and he prescribed a different path for disciple. Then come the question, his early disciple. When you look at the liberation, a uh, liberating process, a liberating experience of the early disciple. Okay, the case stories that we have. There is a large number of the case stories of the early Buddhist disciples, how they went through the liberation, what they experience, what they gain, etc. Uh, in particularly, you find a lot of discourses, and in, more importantly, in the Theragata and Therigata. Theragata records. Theragata and Therigata together records, you know, the life 
struggle process, liberating process of the monks. Theorem is the monks, theorem is the nuns. And in none of these records, there is no any mention of uh, going through or passing through the four stages. So now this is for uh, problematic. Now this is not for the third. Okay, I will explain. Now the third point. There are some hypothetical cases. I call them hypothetical case in the sense that there are some discourses describe the path. If they are, if someone is a Buddhist monk or a nun or a Buddhist practitioner, what path they should follow? So these are not the path actually went through, but these are hypothetical. So it means if somebody go through this, they maintain these, these, these stages. And of them, the Samanya Pala Sutta of the Diga Nikaya, DN is the Diga Nikaya, is a very famous one. Okay, uh, is, a, is a very famous one. And it's prescribed a path from an ordinary man to a state of arahanship. The Samanya Pala Sutta map out, it map out a path from an ordinary worldly person with all greed, hatred, and relation how he progressed along the path and finally became an arahant. And in, in this even hypothetical case, of the Samanya Pala Sutta, there is no mention of the four stages. Okay, there are two stages, last two, there are two stages, but not four stages. So there is no passing through the concept of passing through the four stages is not there. And this Samanya Pala Sutta, you know, has been a very study, a good study has been done on this by Creme McQueen. In his book, uh, actually, he compared different version of the Samanya Pala Sutta. And he has shown all the versions are similar in terms of the content, although there are minor differences. But they all agree in a major content, and there are four stages of six. And content of the Samanya Pala Sutta have been repeated in many discourses. It has been repeated at least in the first 17 discourses actually in the Diga Nikaya. That is the first section of the Diga Nikaya. So these are the, some of the discourses that I listed. I'm not going to read them out. And none of them mention the four stages. And another part, another hypothetical case study, a part that we can say is found in the Satipatthana Sutta of the Majjita, it's Diga Nikaya, it also appearing in the Sanghita Nikaya. There, in, this, there, in this also, there are only two stages, there are no four stages, the theory subsists. And apart from it also, when you go through the, like Attaka Bhagga, Parayana Bhagga, the Sutta Nipada, there is no reference to the theory of four stages to arahanship. Then, this raises a question. If these stages were not the part of enlightenment, enlightening experience of the Buddha, his immediate disciple, his subsequent disciple, it is not the part of being the hypothetical spiritual path designated in the early Buddhist discourses, how later on this theory came to occupy such an important position that today the whole of the spiritual part of the sociological idea is mapped out in terms of these four stages. So this is what made me interested to this study. So this absence of in this make a question, how this theory come in. And in order to situate my work, let me see, to show my work before I proceed my own argument and presentation, I would like to do a very short literature review so that you have a, some background, what is going on in the Buddhist study, what other scholars have said so far, about these stages. 
these four stages, I would rather say, has been taken for granted, this theory of four stages by traditional Buddhists, as soon as the Buddhist scholar. As a result, there are no mass study, almost no study on these stages. No exhaustive study. Everybody take it for granted. They just refer to the four stages. The first person that I see, the first one is the pioneering, is an Islam Blue Honor, well known as I.B. Honor, a great Buddhist scholar and a Pali scholar who has translated the whole of the Vinaya Pitaka from Pali to English. In her book, The Man Perfected, she has a book called The Man Perfected, it's about the concept of Parahamship. And there she has a scepter. One of the scepter is known as the four paths and four fruits. And that is the first book that is published in 1936. That I see uh, she raises a question of the authenticity of the traditional Buddhist Theravada being of going to the four stages. Okay. And she made two assertions, two observations. First, she say the four stages were not the original part to liberation, was not a part of the original part to liberation. It was adopted, okay, later in order to make the path of liberation relevant to more people. Okay, this is the direct quotation. This is the direct quotation that I take from her. It was in order that the majority should be able to look forward to ultimate enlightenment and more especially to the returning here, but once more, not at all. In either case, waning utterly, the concept of four ways was put forward. The four ways refer to the four stages. Secondly, she said the order is not proper. The, in a chronological development, she think the stage of stream entry was the original Buddhist goal. And the arahanship was later developed by monastic, that is the monks and nun. Okay, there's not the original part of early Buddhism. So this is what she said. The second person that I see, of course, this is not an uh, Joss Bond. Uh, he has a small article on the arahanship on the development of arahanship, and it is not a very exhaustive study and not a very comprehensive study. But in his article, he also made some point, very sweeping comment. It's not a sustained argument, but a kind of a sweeping comment. His view is that it's kind of opposite of the earlier of I.B. Honor. He say arahanship. Okay, Arahanship was the original goal of Buddhism. And in the early Buddhist time, that means in the time of Buddha and subsequent in early Buddhism, it was easily achievable goal in one lifetime. It was not a lofty achievement as, as we understand today. It was an easily achievable goal. But with the passage of time, this concept of arahanship exalted that means become more and more distant from us. It's become a highly exalted state that later came to be viewed almost impossible task in one lifetime. Later tradition came to view that arahanship is almost impossible in one lifetime. So when the arahanship become almost impossible in one lifetime, the theory develop, there is need for four stages. So he think the four stages develop when theory of arahanship become a very exalted, very high stage, where it's hardly possible. So that's the view of this. Uh, it's a very sweeping comment. He doesn't make an argument actually. And Pandey, 
Govinda Chandra Pandey or G.C. Pandey, well known in the, I think you know, in the Buddhist studies, a very well known scholar. He has a book, a very famous book called The Origin of Buddhist, Origin in Buddhist Studies, a very thick book. He also takes actually four stages for granted. He does not talk. But in his book, he makes a very small comment. Okay, in one point, he makes a small comment. Uh, it's also very sweeping comment in the sense that it doesn't argue for it. It doesn't provide evidence. It doesn't for or against his argument. He just make a sweeping comment. This, this is what he says. This is the direct quotation of him. About the theory of four stages, it may be observed that it would not have been part of the earliest gospel. That means the earliest spiritual, it's earliest teaching. Gospel means the teaching, okay? This is the term used by him. This is clear from the fact that we find in the Nikaya as earlier non-technical use of the word anagami. Further, had the theory of four magas, that is the four part and the four, four stages corresponding four parlors have been only, we might have accepted, expected some reference to them in the Samanya Pala Sutta. Finally, there is a little positive evidence in favor of regarding the theory as only. So his argument is again, based on the Samanya Pala Sutta, he say, if this was an only theory, there would have been some reference in the Samanya Pala Sutta. So that is his argument. Um, Peter Mospel, Professor Peter Mospel, I heard he passed away uh, recently. He has a small book called Divine Revelation in Pali Buddhism. It's a very small book. Uh, in that, he again doesn't make a sustained argument. He just makes some comment, sometime without providing any references at all. So he again make a comment. Uh, the comment is that he says the Sattakat, okay, Sattakat Parama, that is the liberation in maximum seven lives. That is a state of Arahanshi, uh, stream entry, was developed when disciples were incapable of guiding others on the path that is on the path of Arahanshi. So his view is that the stage of stream entra came to be in place when the disciple, that means the monks and nuns, were not capable of guiding others on the path, on the arahanship. He, they could not make them arahant. So they supplemented with other stages of uh, stream entry. And he further claimed that the Buddhists were influenced, or Buddhists have imitated the four ashrama dharma, means the four stages of Brahmanism, and the Kalpa Sutra of Jainism. Kalpa Sutra is a sutra of Jainism. And so Buddhism, Buddhists just imitated them in the formation of the theory of four stages. In my dissertation, uh, one more. Uh, Professor G. S. Umaratne, that is our professor in our center, he holds a very different view. Apart from all of this, he holds a very complete different views. He holds a kind of a traditional Theravada traditional views that is defending the, uh, defending the tradition that he thinks, you know, four stages were part of the early Buddhist teaching. And they were given by the Buddha they, for different followers, different practitioners based on their needs and psychological uh, states. So this is what he says. Let me just quote it. Buddhism could introduce, we could introduce Arahanship here and now for those who came to seek him no more rebirth. It came to offer he took over the stage of non-return for those who came with the aspiration to have an experience in the higher world before attaining the final goal. It could offer the stage of one's return 
for those who like to come back to this world one more time to have more experience as a human and before attaining the supreme goal finally you to offer the space of the stimentary for those who are not really tired of either this world but like to have an assurance of attaining the supreme goal one day so this is his view of course he doesn't make an argument it, it is actually taken from his footnote he has an article called the five higher fetters so his article is about the fetters not about the four stages but in one footnote this is a footnote too from his article uh, he just make this comment so i take it actually from his footnote is also not a sustained argument in my dissertation of course i have shown uh, kind of refuted their views and their limitation i try to put my argument in this presentation i don't have so much time to take all of their view and what to show why they are right or wrong or their limitation i just give you a general view what is going on in the scholar world about the stereo four stages to have your back and now i straight forward i go to my own presentation what i want to present about it okay the purpose of presentation this presentation this is what i'm going to do okay i'm going to show the four stages were developed not what developed not at the same time rather at different time they came to form as a systematic theory of arahantship at a later time they miss first thing first thing uh, that it that i am going to show is a stage develop independently not collectively independently and at a different time with a different purpose it only at a later time this theory came to be formed known as theory of forest stage arahantship secondly i will try to show some of the contribution of the social religious factor in the formation of the theory of stages to arahantship in other word i will try to show how the sotrological theory that is a spiritual path have been influenced or reshaped by the social factors so that is to say interplay of the sociology and sotriology how this sotriological path has a is linked up with the social factors and religious factors so it's not i'm um, that is to say i'm not taking the four stages as tradition view taught by the buddha um it just one time so this is what i aim to do so in this presentation i will first introduce i talk about these stages separately and then i will talk how the theory why the theory was formed so of course i think you have to bear in mind there is include lot of my spect uh, speculation based on my reading my assumption and my interpretation personal interpretation uh, the reason is that in, in this kind of study there is no clear textual evidence you cannot find a source so you have to read the text you have to interpret you have to find the pieces of evidence here and there and put together and try to make a sense so this is what i have tried so i it is it is it is hope that after this presentation those who are here will have a, a list on view how sotrological ideal develop from different historical and cultural contexts so now i move on i move on to the first stage Oh, I have to. I think I have to very fast. It's already seven. Eh? I just stop. So the I may not able to read actually all the slides. I will try to go through some of them because uh, I think is a uh, presentation is one and a half hour. But I am going to have only one hour. Then I want to give you time so that you can raise some question. So I think I have already taken half an hour just to introduce this. So I will try to little fast. Um, maybe. about some of the slide um he 
what I say is where in general, I'm not going to read everything. I say is the earliest Buddhist theory was the attainment of arahanship in this very long. That is to say, I agree with the Joss Bond because if you read, this is based on the, my reading. If you read any of the early Buddhist sources, uh, early Buddhist discourses, it is quite clear that Buddhism arose mainly as a soteriological religion, mainly a religion that is talking about the salvation, about the liberation. It was not a religion that started with the aim of uh, social change, economical change, not with that kind of purpose. It mainly start with the group of people that were truly interested in the Satrilos in the liberation. The Buddha himself, the founder of Buddhism, was kind of distressed with the mundane life and left the home, everything, in order to find the liberation. And most of his immediate disciple for, were similarly the same. Most of his early disciples, in fact, were already liberated on already renouncing before even they made the Buddha. They were, they renounced the family life, they renounced the social responsibility, seeking for the liberation. So there was a very little space for mundane um, achievement, as well as the theory of liberation in the long future was not a goal. That's really what is not known to the early Buddhists. The goal was immediate liberation as soon as possible. That is, of course, the arahanship in this very long. This was the original goal. So I hold the theory, arahanship was the earliest, earliest among the four stages. Okay. And in fact, in the early Buddhism, you know, they look the family life, social responsibility, family responsibility, kind of hindrance. Because the path advocated by Buddhism require a complete dedication to the practice. So in order to do that, they have to renounce all the family responsibility, social responsibility. That is how the spiritual community of monks and nuns were formed. So they can completely dedicate and attain this path. So um, a Stephen Calling, of course, uh, in his book, the, uh, he, he, he says the Buddhist Sotrilos is immediately applicable and relevant for anyone, anywhere. But in so far, the ultimate attainment of Nibbana requires life of permanent celibacy. That is to say, it requires a complete monks or monks or non-life, complete isolation from the social engagement and family engagement. Then it's relevant. For others, it is not. So what I argue in this my study is that. This has not been a aspiration attractive to the larger number of people in the society. There has always been a small number of people who are ready to renounce everything and seek liberation in this very life, become a monk and nun. This is always a minority. This so only Buddhist sociological ideal was that is the arahanship was only attractive or relevant to small number of people. That is who could meet this high requirement standard. A large section of people in the society, you know, not could not meet this requirement. They could not renounce their family, wall, social interaction, mundane affair. Okay, so this was not a very attractive or not relevant to them. Even if they liked they are, it was not relevant to them. So I try to avoid something so that I can go past because of the time. 
in this time, that is in the earliest Buddhist time, of course there was interaction. There was interaction among the ladies because it has been a custom of the Indian offering to any ascetic, any monks is considered as a meritorious act. So similarly, Buddhist monk got the support from lay people, but it doesn't mean they were Buddhists or they were committed to. Even if they want to be Buddhist, Buddhist has a problem of providing a soteriological idea. That is to say, if the soteriological idea is arahanship in this very life, I am not ready for it. So question is, why should I practice? How irrelevant to me? What can I do with it? Because obviously I'm clear, I'm not going to be liberated in this very life. I'm not ready to renounce my family, social responsibility, all of this kind of thing. So how it relate, how this ideal is relevant to me has been a question. So on the other hand, now I come to the theory of the, this is coming to the stage of the theory of experimentary, the second stage. So chronological, I believe, the theory of, uh, the first is the stage of arahanship, second is coming the stage of experimentary. So on the other hand, Buddhists, well, maybe not in the earliest time, in the bit later time in the Buddha's lifetime itself, and after the subsequent, after to the Buddha, Buddhist monks were very interested in making Buddhism a sustainable religion. A sustainable religion, that is to say, they wanted Buddhism not to disappear, but to stay and compete with the existing religion, like Brahmanism, for instance. And it wants to ensure the continuity, sustainability. And it's clear from the Buddhist discourses, for instance, in the Mahaparamibana Sutta, Buddha himself says that he wants to see his disciples, uh, his Dhamma is sustainable in the society, even after his death. So he foreseen this, you know. So there was a problem. Problem is only a small monks and nuns, a renunciate people, cannot make it a religion sustainable if it is not relevant to the greater masses in the society, if it is not attractive. How? could they make it sustainable? So in order to form the Buddhism sustainable, it needs to develop a strong lay community who does not provide when monks need some requisite, some food and cloth, but take part in Buddhism, Buddhist religion actively and declare themselves as a member of Buddhist community to form a religion. Otherwise, you cannot. And that is actually, you can see from the history, there were, if you read the Samanyapala's uh, Brahma Jala Sutta, they are said to be 62 religions. Most of the religion actually today no more because they could not, you know, have that kind of plan. So they just die out after a few generations of their teachers. So Buddhism has this concept of making Buddhism sustainable. So they realize in order to make Buddhism appealing, attractive, relevant to the people, they have to make sudden, some changes. So the, the changes they bring in a soteriology is the space of instrumentary. So in early Buddhism, in the early years Buddhism, um, instrumentary, is not referred to as we understand a very highly exalted spiritual say, but rather a person who has converted into Buddhism or who have developed the receptivity, taken the Buddhism as a wholeheartedly. That is to say, develop the faith in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. And minimum live uh, ethical life that is by five precepts. I'm not going to read word for word because of the time. I hope you understand it. And this is clear when you read the earliest uh, record of this phase of instrumentary, in particularly 
the Sutta Pati Sangutta of the Sangutta Nikaya. Okay, Sutta Pati Sangutta of the Sangutta Nikaya. So this is what is required in all this stage of instrumentra. For instrumentra, he need unshakable faith in the Buddha, unshakable in the Dhamma, unshakable in the Sangha, and morality dear to noble one. Of course, this is interpreted as five precepts. So although, I think I, I'm not going to discuss this part because what I want to say among the four is the last one. Of course, changeable. It's not that definite because it has been sometimes omitted, sometimes replaced with the generosity, with the kindness and other virtue. The most confirmed thing for a in all the time, the faith in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. Okay? And with this, Buddhism offer a path. What is the path? Um, this you can read. I'm, I'm telling how these uh, four states have been sometimes supplemented, okay? Sometimes omitted. So this is the section that I'm talking. Um, so this is this is what what I was I was trying to say, and it is clear that they were not highly exalted saying, as we try to understand. Because one of the one of the argument traditional Buddhists will say, how about the stream enterers give up the salve? So I will cite two, three examples, just to show that. One is um, Anatta Pindika, is from the Vinaya, okay? He said to be an stream enterer in the, with the first meeting of the Buddha. When he met the Buddha first time, at the text say he become an stream enterer. Later on, in his deathbed, uh, Sariputra and Ananda visited him on his deathbed and gave uh, teaching related to impermanence, unsatisfactory, and unknown so. Okay, that is impermanent, unsatisfactoriness, that is dukkha, suffering, and non so or emptiness, whatever you say. He gave a discourse on that. And Ananda Pindikari regretted. He started to cry. Sariputta's what happened? Why are you crying? Is your pain increasing? The Anatta Pindika, this worldly guy, he said, no, Venerable Sir, that is not the case. I'm crying. I'm regretting because I have been with the Buddha so long time. So long time. But I have never has such a teaching. What teaching? Impermanent, unsatisfactory, non so And the, in this, Sariputra said, this teaching is not taught to the lay people. But interestingly, you'll see, large number of the stream enter in the Pali Canon are the lay people, not the monks and not. So this one. Secondly, there was another lay person called Dhamma Dinna, who approached to the Buddha. And Buddha teach him some Dhamma. Okay, and this is what he says. Okay, he, he says what the Buddha taught him is very profound and super mundane related to emptiness. Okay, yete suttanta tathagata vasita gambira gambiratta lukutra sunyata patisamyutta. I mean, those discourses that taught by the Buddha to him is difficult. And as a lay person, it is difficult to reflect on those teachings while living a life at home with children and wife. And the Buddha advised him to develop the four factor of esteem and tree, that we just saw the four factors. And he say he has it, and he was declared as esteem and tree. So it is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, when Ananda, the Buddha gave a criteria. There are many more, I'm not going to cite all of this. Uh, Buddha gave a criteria, how to declare, say, whoever possess the faith in the triples and the faith in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and observe the morality dear to the noble one, that is a qualified piece of, can be glad, himself or herself. I have destroyed the realm of hell, rebirth this animal, the goals, you know, downfall and rebirth in unfortunate existence. I am a stream enter, not subject to falling into unfortunate existence and certain of perfect enlightenment. That is one day. So this is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Oh, time is going so fast. 
let me just try to finish it. So there are many more. I'm not going to read all of this. So Buddhists develop, what I want to say, Buddhists develop a space of extreme and terror in order to make the Buddhist teaching, Buddhist sociological goal relevant to the lay people. Because Buddhism just cannot give, you know, okay, you make some merit. So if you do the some merit, then you get the uh, good samsara. That is not enough because ultimately Buddhism have to interpret everything on the sociological paradigm. It is the liberation, that is the ultimate goal. So they have to bring the lay people into it. So now with this, they bring into it. So what is the benefit? It's a stage of experimental. He says, okay, now, if you're not ready, no worry. You do do this, 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 and you become experimental. Then by this, you are sure of attaining liberation in a maximum seven lifetime. So if you're not ready, don't worry. Still, you have seven lifetime in meantime to enjoy. And in between, you are also not going to suffer in the hell, not going to suffer in the born in the animal, and you're not going to go to the hungry ghosts, etc. And you're going to be born in a wealthy and good family. So this is quite attractive, quite. And this is actually one of the calls how Buddhism so soon could challenge pragmatism on Indian soil that was there for thousands of years. And it suppresses all other religion, including the Jainism. So this is a Buddhist innovation. This is what I want to say, how the sutra, the stage of stream entry develop. Okay, I say the solution, what consists of shifting the immediate goal to distant goal for common masses, allowing some time for them to attend to their family responsibility and enjoy other mundane facility before the final goal. So it being both under the same spiritual ideal, but one immediate, one at a distance. The stage of extreme uh, non returned is, of course, also very early. It's as early as I believe with the stage of extreme entry because I, uh, it's quite early, you find in many discourses, extreme and uh, non returning and the arahanship together without the first two. Okay. Um, Oh, this is the one screen. Once returning, I argue this is the latest among the four developed. It was originally a sub stage, later become a complete stage in Abhidhamma time. There are evidence for it. I have cited some evidence, but I don't think I can go through it. If I have a time, I will come back later. So I try to move a stage of non returning. So as I said, the space of non-returning is uh, closely related to the arahanship. Uh, these two stages together in many discourses, it is mentioned one who practiced the Buddhist path could get one of the two stages. Either the realization of goal in the very life, if there is a residue, remain the stage of non-returning. These are the sources, there are many, dis many, many discourses. So I said there are Possibly, my argument, there are possibly two reasons for this stage. One, although a stage of extreme entry was developed for lay people, it doesn't exclude that there were lay followers who were as serious as monks and nuns. Not everyone same. There are lay followers, just like today, there are lay followers who are more spiritually advanced than a monk. Okay, this was the case at that time too. Among the level what there were people who were very advanced on a spiritual path. Okay, so, but in the early Buddhist time, the did not allow arahanship. They did not want to, they, they did not at least want to see, or the Buddhists did not want to see later the stage. There is a controversy whether there was a Nearahan in the early time or not. But at least, at least a later tradition did not want to see lay Arahan. They want to see only the monastic Arahan. So they want to maintain this hierarchy, not the lay Arahan, because the Arahanship is the highest. They don't want to attribute it to the lay people, even if they're capable. So all the Buddhists interpret the highest stage 
a lay practitioner can gain in the space of non-return. My means they will not reborn into this world anymore, but they will reborn in the PU land or PU abode and attain Ibana from there. That is one. Another point is there is also another problem. Now, sometimes maybe someone it, in, it can include even a monks and nuns. They're so close to the arahanship, but before that, they somehow could not make it. No question come. After practicing so much, if I do not gain it, what do I gain? If I could not make the arahanship possible. So they introduce a stage of non-returning. Okay, you get this and you don't come back here. You go to the PU one or PU both, and you attain arahanship there. So these are the two stages. For the first, this is the discourse that support my argument. Because here the Vashtagutta, a Brahmin, was a, okay, he asked the Buddha, you see, he say whether there were any monks or nam who achieved tranquility, wisdom, freedom from cankers. Freedom came from cankers equal to arhanship. In their response, the Buddha said, there are more than 500 monks and nam who have destroyed the cankers and become arahan. Then Vastagutta asked the question, whether there are was a single layman or woman who have become a non-returning through destruction of five fetters. He did not ask whether they become monks or not. That means by this time, what I want to say, it was already accepted. The highest achievement a lay follower can gain is a non-returning. So that he was given. He's close, very close to Arahanship, but is below it. So I argue for this purpose, a stage of non-returning developed. So I'm coming almost to, uh, so this is the summary of the, what I said, the chronological development and the, what the gain, motive behind, I have explained, because we are coming to 7.30 almost, so I need to talk a little bit. No question is that if they were developed for different states, different time, at different period, with the different motives, how it become a theory and when it become a theory of four stages in the history of Buddhist thought. One thing, is that what I argue, gradually, Buddhism has start, when it has started to span its number, its community, and become an institutionalized religion. The spiritual zeal the, of the monastic community continue to decline. That means the commitment to the arahanship in this one lifetime, continued to decline. And they were more, in, more engaged with social, institutional, religious duty. So they were not truly concerned. The commitment now shifted from the immediate arahanship to now preserving the text, writing the text, teaching the Dhamma, training, all of this kind of thing, okay? This has, there's a quantity, development of the quantity as a Buddhist community have infected the quality of the monastic community. So gradually, even for monastic, since they were not engaging, they were not committing sincerely into it, into liberation in this life, the arahanship, even for monastic, came to be a, this thing go because they were not attaining arahanship anyway in one lifetime. Because now they are engaged with many, many things. There's one very clear um, um, uh, point is the ordination of child, okay, young monk. Obviously you see all the monks, they were all who individual, who were sincerely looking for liberation disgusted with their mundane affairs or were no more interested. But gradually, in order to make Buddhism an institutionalized religion, when you make it an institutionalized religion, you have many responsibility. You need to take care of the lady, study, write tests, compose tests, many, many things, duties. Then you need, you know, monastic member to do that. Then in order to fulfill this, they started this in a child ordination. So, child ordination, obviously, you can understand. 
Of course, I don't uh, leap out the possibility there may be some exception. Some child from young age maybe sincerely want the liberation, but this is a very rare case. This can only religiously argue, put out, but in, in reality, it is the tradition encouraging young child to come to the Sangha. And the, the purpose is not to make them liberated, but to preserve the teaching. May have the more monastic members. So the, among these monks, the spiritual gene was not as strong as of the early Sangha. So it become gradually arahanship that came to be perceived a very achievable goal in this lifetime become a very distant goal. That kind of evidence you already you find by Buddha Gosha, he says, you know, in his time, fifth century AD, he said a Thomas Paine monastery was not conducive to meditation as there are too many inhabitants, too much noise. The monastic life were bounded by duties of communal life, obligation to the laity, arrival of visitor, other interruption. He was already saying monastics were not even meditating. They were not meditating. And it's truly even the case. So they were doing all other things, not meditating. So they shifted their priority. If they shift the priority, then they are also need a sociological framework on a spiritual ideal. If you are not aiming at enlightenment, what do you get? If you don't attain how your practice is valid. On this, gradually, this theory came to be applied, become a generalized a spiritual ideal for both lay and the monastery. Because in terms of a spiritual commitment, we become quite similar. Monastic and lay become quite similar. So this, this, this came to be applied to the monastery. The question would be when it happened. It's very difficult to say. There is no canonical textual records. There is no archaeological record for this. No one way, if you don't find canonical uh, textual record, is the archaeological record, the scholarly way to find it. But there's no archaeological record too. But archaeological re records, as uh, Jogari Sofin has shown in the Baharut and Sansi, belong to 120 BCE before the common era. He already pointed out there were, you know, many monks making a donation. So now they become a kind of donors and wishing for future birth, liberation in future, not in this life, and aiming at merit. In only Buddhism for monastic, there is no merit. It's about the liberation. Now monastic were doing this. So by, by this time, it's already established that monastics were already engaged and they were known as Dhamma Katika and you know, all these preachers, etc. So if this dating of the discretion is correct, then evidence implies that by time monastic members had already shifted their emphasis from immediate liberation to merit making activity. And their expertise in learning was already highly valued within the society. Okay. And Katavattu, one of the Abhidhamma texts, already shows that debate on the four stages among the different Buddhist schools. And all of the Buddhist schools accepting it, but they have a certain different views. That would, that would you know, lead us to conclude that by this time, already the theory of four stages parahanship was generalized. It was meant for monastic and non-monastic, already were taken as an exalted stage. So this might have taken place, very difficult to give exact, exact time, within the first 100 years of the Buddha. Then, within the first 100 years of the oppressed Buddhas, that this might have taken place. But this is a very vague assumption, cannot prove with evidence. So this is what I want to say. I was actually very fast, but I think I almost make it. And because I promised to give you half an hour time for answering, questioning. So this is what I want to say. Now, if you have any question, please. Okay, the time now is open to questions. As you see just now, Venerable Dr. Amit Ananda has given a very 
brief introduction to his uh, research. And I believe that this research is based on his uh, PhD thesis, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you see that there are lots of materials. I hope that uh, the audiences can raise up some questions so that he can elaborate more on his findings, okay? So please. Hi. Ah, yes, I'd love to ask um, a question. Sure. Yeah, so thank you so much for that talk. I was just wondering if you could comment on the fact that in many early Buddhist suttas, the entire audience will get enlightened right after hearing the Buddhist words. And so our shift seems to be, as you were saying, quickly attainable almost immediately for some people. And then you were saying that later on these stages developed. Why? in the early Buddhist suttas, was that the case, that people would be instantly enlightened? And how did that sort of die off? Um, well, there's a two point I want to say. First thing, um, discourses always like to give the number in a big figure, like uh, at the end of the discourse, 500, 1,000, 10,000. They always like to give a big figure, how many people at an arahanship or uh, different stages. So that is actually very difficult to verify exact, exact number. One of the reason could be uh, the listeners themselves were very genuine, very sincere to the spiritual practice. As I said, many of these followers who came close to the Buddha in all the time, they themselves were seriously seeking for liberation. They were already, you know, disappointed in the mundane life. They were no more interested in other worldly, you know, benefits. They were truly seeking for liberation, so they were ready. And perhaps Buddha was also skillful, but that is not to say that everyone made the Buddha become Arahant. That's not the case. So in many of the cases, it was like this. And some cases, I think it was a fabrication on the part of Buddhists to show the greatness of Buddha that after this discourse, this thing happened like this. So it was, I think, a religiously fabrication, what we call a pious fabrication to develop the faith, a greatness of the teachers, the founders. Is that clear? Yeah, no, very clear. Thank you very much. Welcome. Um, thank you, Venerable, for the explanations. Uh, are you born? I have a question on because they already systemize all these four stages, right? Yes, exactly. So, right. So my understanding is that why didn't they actually go in detail on how do you get from stream streamer, a uh, uh, stream entry, and then to one streamer? Why is there like no certain details in between the path on how to practice to the next stage? Exactly. Uh, there is no a very concrete step-by-step -step practice. It's only given in terms of the uh, fetus. Like uh, from this stage to attend this stage, for instance, you know, from the stream enterer to a one's returner, you have to weaken the greed, hatred, and delusion. But how do you do it? What is the practice? That has uh, not been Explain in that way. So only in the Abhidhamma and the Pali commentaries, you do see, it says, for instance, uh, many, many times these stages were discussed in terms of the five special faculty, you know, faith, uh, wisdom, effort, mindfulness. Okay, these are, there are five special faculties. So very often they are talking about in terms of the five special faculty. It's only say that you continue to practice more on that, or you practice the doctrine of non-self, you continue to practice the same one. There is no a very clear cut actually theory. That is why I say the you know, four stages is kind of a more like a sotrological idea than actual practice. And that is also very clear when the Buddha Gosha in the Bisuddhi Magga, you know, had constructed a singular a path to the liberation. Bisuddhi Magga have provided a very beautiful path from the ordinary person to the Arahanship. You see what he does. 
he has not constructed the path on this theory. He rather shifted all the four stages in the final stage. It's not from the beginning. It's actually contradictory to the early Nikayas. In early discourses, you see no stream enter is an ordinary person. Now in the Visuddhi Magga, you find after doing everything, after understanding, the final is a momentary part. Just a moment you attain all of the four stages. So actually they become more like a ideal than an actual practice. Because I don't know so for any Buddhist practitioner student or any teachers teaching the Buddhist path based on these four stages. Okay, you attain this stage from here, you practice this from this to this stage. Rather, they take the four stages as a kind of a spiritual map. It's a kind of map, or you attain this, then you attain it, but not one by one that, as you say, it has not been there. Um, sorry, if I can ask again, sorry. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so then how does the Noble Eightfold Path plays a part in the four stages of Arahatship then? Okay, very good question. Yeah, so... Um, Two times, this question is raised two times. One is in the Sangita Nikaya, uh, another time in the Anguttara Nikaya. In the Anguttara Nikaya, the Noble Eightfold Path is not taken as a Noble Eightfold Path, but only the three, Sila, Samadhi, and Panya. Okay, morality, concentration, and wisdom. And so far as the Pali, uh, that is the one place it says, a stream entera and the one's returner. Uh, fulfill the immorality. Once returner and the student fulfill the morality, they have a little bit. Okay, matta so partially develop concentration and wisdom. Non-returner develop morality and concentration, a partial development of wisdom. And the arahan develop all three completely. So this is the one path. And the, in the Sangita Nikaya, there is a passage that Buddha is asking Sariputra. Sariputra is talk about the Sutapati, Sutapati, like a stream enter, stream enter. What is a stream enter? What is the path to stream enter? He says, a stream enter is a noble at pull path. The stream enter, stream enter, stream enter is noble at pull path. And it does not relate with other stages. The whole of the uh, path of a stream entry is related with the Noble Eightfold Path. Then it doesn't relate how we relate to the stream enter, once eternal, non returner Apart from these two sequence, two occurrence, in the whole of the canonical text, there is no uh, clear definition or correlation between the Noble Eightfold Path and the four stages. Thank you, Venerable Bohama Istuti. Welcome. Hello, any more question? Okay, there is an, um, somebody write a question here. Okay, there is a question, is there any training manual for a being an arahant? Any sutta. Uh, there are many suttas. One sutta that I, I, I gave is the Samanyapala Sutta. The Samanyapala Sutta of the Diga Nikaya is a kind of manual. It has started with as a lay person, an ordinary person, you listen and how you renounce and what your stages you go through, and finally became an Araha. But as I said, in this sutta, the four stages are not related. It's actually the four jhanas. Is the actually in morality, then you after the morality, you attain the practice meditation, then you attain the fourth jhana. From fourth jhana, you get insight, then you attain arahanship. So that is the Samanyapala Sutta is one of the very good discourse that give a very detailed path from an ordinary person to arahanship. And if you want to see more, Later texts, like in the Theravada tradition, is the 
part of purification or the Visuddhi Magga. My Buddha Gosha in the fifth century AD composed a book called Path of Purification. It also uh, given beautiful, beautifully explained the path in terms of sevenfold purification. Again, he does not explain the path in, uh, rela in relation to the four stages. He just put the four stages in the last stage, not in as a whole path. He constructed the path in terms of sevenfold purification, satta visuddhi. Okay, so in terms of the sevenfold purification, satta visuddhi. So this part, this book also gives you a very detailed explanation from an ordinary person to an arahant, what you need to do. It includes the concentration morality, concentration meditation, inside meditation, and it also explains what stages that you go through, what kind of experience you experience. So it's a very uh, beautiful manual or a guide for an arahantship. I hope I have explained this question. Is it clear? Okay, there is another question. Now, what is the difference between the Arahant in Theravada Buddhism and Arihant in Jainese? Okay, uh, basically it's the same. First of all, Arihant is in Jaini Buddhism and the Arahant in the Theravada Buddhism or in the Buddhism in general is basically the same because in both tradition, they mean it is a person who is liberated who is liberated, get rid of everything. Is a liber Arahan is also liberated. The difference in Jainism, for instance, and the Buddhism, in Jainism, they have a cell of theory of soul. So in Jainism, the, when it can Arahan means, the Arahan, his soul is liberated. It's liberated from the bondage. It's liberated from the bondage. In Buddhism, there is no soul. When an Arahan is liberated, he understands there is no a notion, a reality called soul or self. So actual definition of what they attain, there is a difference. One is attainment of self in Jainism. It is the self, purified self. It's a purification and a free from the bondage. In Buddhism, Arahan is also free from the bond, from the fetus. But so he's liberated. Liberated from what in when Buddhism is liberated from greed, hatred, and delusion. And he, he does not realize there is a self, rather, he realized there is no self, the whole. Thing. So the experience is different in two religions, but in terms of the concept of liberation, both tradition accept, yes. If you are interested to read, uh, please read the theory, a book by The Man Perfected by Ivy Horner, the one author I have cited. She has uh, written a book and she compared the concept from Jainism to Buddhism, the concept of Arahan from Jainism to Buddhism. Uh, please, you can read to find more detail about it. Uh, I didn't hear it clearly, uh, Reverend Sir. Uh, uh, could you please repeat the name of uh, the the book yeah. again. The man perfected. Okay. The man perfected. The, the man perfected. So I think you got it right. I can see the it's right here. Um, the, oh, I got it. I got okay. it. The yes. book is called Samanyapala Sutta. Let me just try for you. It's, I think it's here. Samanyapala Sutta. I mentioned about this. Yeah, Samanyapala Sutta. I think you can see here. This is the discourse. Samanyapala Sutta of the Diganikaya. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, hello, thank you for a very uh, comprehensive presentation. Oh, Jaws. Uh, can, I, uh, can you tell us, please, what are the arguments uh, that Macqueen has uh, to say that uh, the Samanyapala Sutta uh, belongs to the early strata of uh, scriptures. Uh, this, uh, her main argument is that 
the content of the study, um, he compared these uh, Samanyapala Sutta in a Chinese version. I think there are four, four or some version in Chinese, one in Nepali. There is another version of, I, I forget, there are total six version of it. He compared the six version and he find out the content of the, all the six version are so similar. They are very similar, except some minor differences. So based on these the similarity of the content in all the different version of the version of the Samanyapala Sutra, he comes to conclusion this should be a discourse belong to the earlier phase of Buddhism. So all Buddhist tradition, you know, accept it. There is no dispute. So that is the one uh, of the one of the main argument. One of his main argument in this book. Thank you. Welcome. Any other question? Okay, let me ask you a question. Sure. Yes. Uh, you know, so Buddha Maitreya is very famous in Mahayana Buddhism, right? It's yes. regarded as a future Buddha, and the same concept is in the Theravada Buddhism. The uh, uh, Metta Buddha, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's mentioned already in some Pali suttas. So, well, in this case, Metta Buddha is going to be a Buddha in future, and for the next life, he will be born in the uh, Dushita heaven. So, in that case, can we say that he is regarded as a, a once returner, according to this category? Oh, yeah, where you bring out a very interesting question, whether Buddhas can also be called stream enterer. There is an interesting passage in the Katavattu. There was a Buddhist school called Samitya and Andakas. They had the view that the Buddha attained, for instance, our historical Buddha, you're talking about the Buddha Sakyamuni, has attained a stage of stream entry in the time of Buddha Dipankara. Okay, so there means when they started the Buddhist path, they already attained the stage of first stage assurance. The Theravada tradition says, no, it is not possible because if a Buddha attained this, one, any one of the stages in his early lifetime under any Buddha, then they might be considered as a disciple. They cannot be called a Bodhisattva. Therefore, Theravada commentary says, the Buddha also attained the four stages. When in his last life, in last life under the Buddha tree, before enlightenment, he goes through all the four stages, now before it. So according to Theravada traditional view, commentarial views, or Bandhavi Dhamma views, the Maitreya cannot be called a uh, stream enterer. He will go through all four stages only in his last life when he born as a human being and going to become Buddha under the Bodhi tree, he will go through all the four stages. So until that he is not an stream enterer because if he already become a stream enterer, he will consider kind of a Sravaka, disciple. So that is the traditional view. Of course, this is again in the early Buddhism as I show the four paths were never, four stages were, has never been mentioned in the context of Buddha. But later Pali tradition has a problem. Now it's the authenticity problem because for a Buddhist, Buddha is our, our teacher. We are supposed to follow the path preached by the Buddha or our faith in the assumption that is the path is valid when it brings the fruits. How it brings the fruit, the Buddha became enlightened. So there about the tradition later on, try to interpret the four stages with the Buddha. So the tradition also says, the commentaries also says, the for Buddha goes through the four stages in his last life. So according to that theory, although there has never been a mention about the Maitreya, so it is, according to tradition, he cannot. But as I explained from the discourses, if you look at the Maitreya, from the perspective of the early Buddhist discourses, definitely he is, because definitely if he's practicing for enlightenment, he has faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and he must be a moral person, he's a Buddhist So he should be a stream enterer, but 
According to tradition, he's not. Technically, he's not. Is that clear? Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. So, Venerable, there's one more question on the group chat. Yeah, I think there is uh, one. Okay, let me just read the question, then I answer. Is the a, a saying of everyone can attain the arahanship related to later Buddha nature theory in Mahayana Buddhism? Uh, in very specific way, if I, to, if I am to answer in a very specific way, yes, it is a Mahayana theory that everybody is endowed with Buddha nature. That endowed with Buddha nature is not the teaching of Theravada Buddhism or early Buddhism. But if you look at the early Buddhism, the implication is there. Implication is there is also says anyone, anyone I'm referring to human being particularly, because early Buddhism is not talking about everyone, including all the sentient being, and particularly the, any human being is capable of attaining enlightenment if they practice. But it's not explicitly explained. It is only in the later Mahayana Sutra that is very clearly, explicitly explained everyone is endowed with Buddha nature. May I ask one more question? Sure, sure. There is one more question. First, let me take this one. How to define the Titankara in Jainism, I mean, Theravada for Kateri Parahanship? Uh, the concept Titankara means the, uh, let me just think. Titankara is, I think, the ending of the tradition or something. I actually, I forgot this term, but uh, actually it has uh, nothing, no relevant with the uh, theory of four stages. Rather, uh, four stages have some connection with the Jain, Jainist 14 stages. Jainish has constructed a theory called 14 stages. Actually, it is in my dissertation, so it's also in me, I didn't discuss it, because they have uh, 14 stages. There are some of the stages are similar to the four stages. Uh, they are also controversy whether the Jain borrow from Buddhist or Buddhist borrow from Jain, but many of the, because it is appearing in the Kalpa Sutra, the authors of the Jain is author uh, who wrote on the Kalpa Sutra. There seems to take the Jain and the Kalpa Sutra a bit later than the Buddhist discourses. So we cannot say who borrowed from whom directly. Uh, they are not one-to-one -one correspondent. The, this is actually with the more to do with the 14 stages and the four stages in Buddhism. The Titankara is a title. It's a title for the, the Mahavira. That is for their, their teacher, like the Buddha in the Buddhism. So the Mahavira has many titles. Like one is Mahavira, he's called Jaina, this one is called Titankara. So this is nothing to do with the four stages. Pomo is duty, Danyavan. Thank you. Yes, uh, Jones, you want to ask a question, please? Yes, um, I remember that uh, in Yogacara, uh, they have a difficulty accepting that uh, Arahants in uh, early Buddhism, they really get liberated. So, and can we relate this theory of four stages um, to their understanding of uh, Buddhahood and uh, their view of liberation. I think the Yugachara, and in particular all of the uh, Buddhist school, as in the beginning of this talk, the Dr. Mingyang has also pointed out in the Pasnaparamita Sutra, you know, the Arahan is already considered as a liberated being. So I think there is uh, no question about it. It's only that there are some argument, whether they are equal to the Buddha, their level of wisdom, the same as the Buddha, whether they're inferior. So in, in most of the early Buddhist tradition, including Yogacara, of course, consider take the Arahan 
as a liberated being, but they are of course inferior to the Buddha. They inferior to the Bodhisattva. They are only the disciple. And there was some argument forward by certain Buddhist tradition, whether they are in what sense they're not completely perfect or they're inferior. So it is only the one of the discourse in the Mahayana tradition called the Lotus Sutra, where Arahanship is not taken as a completely liberated state. The slightly different display, that is a different argument. Actually, it has nothing to do with the four stages. They also accept the four stages. Even in the early Mahayana Paisthan Paramita literature, the four stages are accepted already. So the argument is different. So I think the, what you're asking is difficult to relate. Okay, it's a very difficult to relate this arahanship with the four stages in the Yogacara to this one. So there is one more question. Let me just see. Thank you. Uh, wait a minute. Let me just add something to Dr. Amrinanda's uh, answer. Uh, in fact, if you read the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, you will find that they have uh, elaborated on the uh, four stages. And when they define the four fruitions, they are talked about in terms of abandoning defilements. So the four stages are different because their levels of abandoning, abandoning defilements are different. Uh, you will find such a, a, a words in Shravaka Bhumi. And also even, uh, yeah, this is because, you know, the Shravaka Bhumi belongs to the Shravaka stage of the Yogacara. And also even in Vasubandhu's latest work, uh, the Trimshika Karika, on the Vishnyapti Matrata, uh, the mere cognition. And you will find that although at that time she has already been a Mahayanist, but he also mentions the Arhaship. And it is only in the uh, commentaries on it by Stila Mati, we find that that Arhaship is defined as Buddhahood. So even we know that for the yoga charas, uh, I think these four stages are uh, also applies to them, okay? Yeah, I think this is, I uh, just want to add here, it is, I think the common, as I say, it is a common doctrine among all Indian Buddhist school. Even if you read the Sarvastivada, the Abhidharma Kosha, Vaishya, Abhidharma Kosha, you also find the four stages. So they all, because these are Sravaka, these are the path, they're also talking about the difference in terms of the abandonment of the defilement or the fetus. Sarvastivada, for instance, define their, their, explain the defilement in different categories. And according to that, displaying the four stages, there are some differences for understanding the Theravada tradition and the Sarvastivada tradition, uh, like whether one can really become a non-returner immediately without the first two stage, whether they can have to go through all these. That argument is there. So that is there, of course there, but then, so thank you, Mingyuan, for adding this. The question is, there's somebody asking a question. Is, yeah, and is that, there has any to be the, that has to be our last question. Okay, let me see. Is there any Theravada mentioned the Arahan, Arahat Garba, correspond to Tathagata Garba? Uh, is there any come mentioned? Uh, in so far, the, all the Buddhist discourses are concerned. In so far, early Buddhist discourses are, confer, are concerned. There is no mention of Tathagata Garba or the Arahat Garbha. It is a late development. It is development at the later a Buddhist school that developed. The development came towards a later school like uh, when the Yuga Chara school were developing and different is, there were different argument. It's also very interesting actually to see how the different school developed different thought like Yuga Chara, the Madhyamika, you know, one is responding to another school. The Tathagata Garbha, concept is a late Buddhist concept. So it's not found in early Buddhist discourses. There is no sutras that is in the Pali canon. Okay, uh, talking about the Tathagata Garbha concept. Oh, there is no concept called Arahat Garbha. The term Garbha is there. Garbha is used in a different sense. The term Garbha is there. More, not the Tathagata Garbha, the Araham Garbha in the sense of the term used in the letter text. I hope it is clear to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Venerable Dr. Amrilananda, for your great lecture today. And uh, we have to put an end today. 
Uh, and also we thank all the audiences for your participation and we had a very uh, enjoyable discussion. Uh, also, we have to thank uh, Gloria Sun Charity Foundation for their support of our lecture series. And next, our lex uh, next lecture will be given by Dr. Bonnie Wu uh, on the coming Thursday. And the topic is the development of evaluation of a novel uh, group-based Mahayana Buddhist intervention awareness training program. And uh, we wish to see you again. Okay, thank you very, very much. And we hope all of you can attain either attain arhatship in this life or become a Buddha in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.